Well, Neil, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to sit down and answer questions around the Minds of Portland Transport readers. This is our fourth year, so we've enjoyed it and hope you do as well. Well, it's my pleasure. And uh, again, I want to thank you for the great work of the Transport Blog in terms of actually providing, I think, a great voice within the community. So I appreciate that. All right. Well, let's get started. So the questions today are divided into four major sections. The first is the labor relationship. I think mm -hmm. what what's on everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. um, let's start with the, the existing contract. There have been several arbitration and court rulings, uh, but there are still some things that are on appeal. Right. Could you tell us what's still sort of yet to be decided and what the impacts are for riders if it goes either way? You bet. So the first thing is that, um, uh, just to note, uh, and I think your question implies this, which is that there is a great deal of uncertainty as related to labor costs, which is literally half of our operating budget when you really think about it, um, as we move into the budget for fiscal year 14. And that's one of the challenges we've got because we feel like we're building uncertainty on, t on top of uncertainty. So related to the contract that ended November 30th of last year, Recall that an arbitrator in August uh, awarded the contract, that proposal that TriMet had made, so TriMet was the winner. The ATU uh, appealed that. That appeal was to the Employment Relations Board. That appeal um, was heard in terms of oral briefing and it's been briefed since by the, uh, by the attorneys since then, and so now we're awaiting a decision. And it could be any day or it could be you know a couple of months, nobody, mm -hmm. Uh, really knows the timeline of that. That's a pretty important decision because mm -hmm. it is really the foundation from which both uh, our um, our budget is built, and we're assuming that that uh, arbitration decision is sustained in the current budget moving forward for fiscal year. And that allows you to make some service improvements next exactly. year. Exactly, yeah. um, and it allows us to have uh, no no fare increase, no service cuts, mm -hmm. and some some service improvements. So it's really it's significant, and it also is a building block for the negotiations for the next contract. Mm -hmm. Now, I think the important thing to note that the, you asked for the impact on the writers, right. and um, in any case, we can I, we we believe that we can sustain the level of service as as proposed in the fiscal year 14 budget through that fiscal year. Mm -hmm. But were we to lose um, that um, appeal? Uh, then we're going to be into service reductions or fare increases and this, this sort of cutback mode um, next fiscal year, for fiscal year 15. Hmm. Um, unavoidably, it's, it's probably six to eight million dollars a year worth of, of cost. Now, all of that you know, is underlined by what's the economy doing, what are the other issues of, of the day. So we'll obviously fine tune that as we progress, but it's a very significant building block. The other remaining um, issues have to do with, um, and, and part of that, by the way, um, is the, uh, wrapped into all of this on the last contract was a unfair labor practice that the uh -huh. ATU won, and based on that, we owe the employees about 3.6 million. We're appealing that um, to the Court of Appeals because we don't believe that the ERB uh, was completely right in its analysis of that decision. Um, but also as part of the arbitration, um, just to make things totally confusing, there is a reimbursement of medical premiums from employees uh -huh. uh, over time. Now, that 3.6 and the reimbursement of employees are one-time only costs, so they're important. Uh, we have to pay attention to them, but the real fundamental for us is what is the base of the agreement moving forward uh -huh. in what we call our continuing expense category. Well, let's talk next about the the current round of labor negotiations that have started. Um, ATU has asked that the current round be open to the, the press and or the public. Uh, what's TriMet's stance on that and, and where are we at now? So first of all, we have coming this Saturday on the 27th, the first meeting, which is really to set the ground rules for negotiations and the uh, admittance of press or the public. Uh, but I, I think the issue really comes down to the press at this point in time will be one of the conversations of those ground rules. TriMet's position is that the press should be admitted, and we talk about sort of the major uh, elements of the press. We think that that provides good public transparency and accountability, having the press there. We don't want it open to the public, and the main reason for that is that these are really serious conversations 
we don't need cheerleaders in the in the in the in the back rows. We don't need people playing to a crowd. We don't. We need very serious rapt attention to the difficult issues that we have. And just to reiterate, the key issues there, the key drivers of climate cost structure right now are um, the uh, health benefit for active and retirees. Um, and you know, I'm really cautious to say that nobody's. This is really nobody's fault, and it's important, I think, to note that. But right now, the benefit that we have is just not sustainable. The math doesn't work. And so that's a reality that both parties have to understand and come to. Those kind of issues are very hard work and a lot of mutual education that needs to go on. And that's what the collective bargaining process is all about, and that's what we're looking forward to getting going with. Okay. We're leading into the next question. Um, so you highlighted that, that the health costs are uh, an important part of the, the, the budget and labor negotiations. Um, you know, the union has made a lot of hay recently about the way that um, raises were handed out in this last budget and uh, at least the, the perceived lack of transparency around that process. Uh, I think it's, it's hard for the public to know the charges and counter charges going back and forth, who to believe, what's the truth. Uh, in a post on Portland Transport a few months ago, I suggested that uh, the public might benefit greatly from an independent audit and benchmarking against other agencies to see where TriMet's financials really stack up against other comparables. Um, is that an idea you've considered? Are you open to it? You know, I'm certainly open to it. Um, but I would also tell you that if you look at our arbitration presentation from last August, you'll find all of those benchmarks. You'll find all of those. Um, peer comparisons that you're talking about in terms of uh, both wages and health care uh, benefit. So all of that exists and is in the public record, in the public realm right now. But that's um, TriMet's compilation of the data as opposed to an independent review. And, you know, an independent review is fine, but, uh, you know, these are generally pieces of information that are pulled from the National Transit Database. These aren't exactly, um, you know, secret sources of information by any means. They're very public uh, pieces of information. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I understand the charges and counter charges, and I think it's really important for uh, both TriMet and the ATU to, as we enter into this round of negotiations to try to lower the, the tone of volume and try really hard to make sure that we both are doing a good job of educating not only ourselves, but our constituents about the issues that we face. Mm -hmm. Our cry about the health care benefit is not to the detriment of our employees who we have a great deal of regard for it, obviously, um, and hold in high, high regard. Uh, but it is simply the math that's not sustainable. And there's lots of ways to begin to deal with that. And if we begin to hear what's important from the ATU, maybe we can find some uh, mutual ways um, to get to a right solution. But that's what collective bargaining is all about. Okay. Yeah, healthcare is clearly a big deal in our whole society. Yes. Uh, and we have changes happening under the Affordable Care Act right. and the state of Oregon will soon be setting up health exchanges to make it easier for people to right. buy insurance. Will any of that help TriMet situation? Um, not that I see right now. Um, there's some potential on horizon, I think. Uh, but what we're learning from this, um, and we've had a lot of uh, you know, brown bag lunches and, and other kinds of exchanges with people in the healthcare industry at TriMet, uh, and we need to do, to broaden that exchange, I think, uh, with some of our union leadership and union members. Um, but the changes within the healthcare industry are absolutely dramatic uh, and largely occurring because of the Affordable Care Act um, and particularly because Orion is an innovator uh, in that. What we're learning is uh, literally it's one of these 80-20 rules where 20% of our enrollees in the healthcare uh, policies are responsible for 80% of the cost. Um, so what many intelligent insurance programs, and I think Kaiser, for example, is one of them, are doing is really working with that 20% to make sure they're getting excellent care, but also not wasting the dollars for extra tests or other things uh, along the way. Meanwhile, looking at those that might be close to entering that 20% category and working with them to stay healthy. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a lot associated with that that 
um, that I think can be done and will be layered on to what are c sort of considered normal insurance policies as we move ahead. Um, so you talked about the, the portion of the population that, that drives the expense uh, and efforts to make your employees healthier. Um, yeah, driving a bus has got to be a challenge from a health point of view. You're sitting all day. Uh, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to have a desk job, but you know, even in my world, people now have standing desks and treadmill desks because we recognize that sitting uh, is, is not a good thing uh, to do all day. Um, has anybody ever built a bus you could drive standing up or in some healthier posture than, <laughs> than sitting in that chair all day? I'm not, I'm not sure that, but there is an awful lot of work that goes into the ergonomics of the driver's mm -hmm. seat and the driver location. You know, a lot of people don't realize, and actually there's, there's still something we're doing to fine tune this, but the newest buses that we brought, just the 50, one of the 55 new buses, they actually have pedals that can move back and forth on a, on mm. a, on a plate so that, you know, for example, I interviewed one um, relatively petite driver who said these are absolutely the best buses you've ever had, but it was particularly true for her because her feet huh. didn't have such a hard time reaching the pedals. So there's a lot that I think we can do related to the ergonomics of the job and really focus on, uh -huh. and actually our safety department is, is doing that on a regular basis. Matter of fact, our Type 5 LRVs coming for the Portland Milwaukee project are having sort of another remodel, if you will, of the cab so that we make sure that we're doing what we can related to ergonomics. Hmm. But I also say that, you know, there are lots of times during an operator's day where you could get out and walk at a layover or mm -hmm. uh, take advantage of the times uh, at transit centers. So that's one of the things we have to really encourage. It, it is a sedentary job in terms mm -hmm. of sitting and there's a lot of stress associated with it. It's really important to sort of work that out when the opportunities are, uh, avail themselves. Okay. So we've had one very contentious contract negotiation that went way over the timeline. We're heading to another that appears very contentious. What's the prospect for getting to a more productive and cooperative labor relationship over the long term? How do we not have every contract be putting you know, service to riders at risk and have all this uncertainty for everyone? Well, um, my view, and I know it's not one that's held by everyone, is that um, the binding interest arbitration statute was one of the um, mistakes, uh, allowing that to go through without uh, a word of protest was a, a mistake of TriMet in 2007. The, the, the thing about normal collective bargaining is that there is a deadline mm -hmm. and there is a cliff and there is a need to come to agreement. And if you look over the 40 years of TriMet's history, um, that's what happened uh, time after time again. Um, the problem right now with binding interest arbitration is that um, it's not very timely, as you noted in the first mm -hmm. go-around, and it's the second go-around doesn't seem to be performing much different, and that puts everybody, including our, our employees, at a great deal of uncertainty and risk. Um, but it also, the question with the ERB review of the arbitrator's decision, is it really binding? Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, I think there's a problem there. That's number one. But number two, if that's going to be the rules of the game, then what we have to do is operate the best we can. And I think the best we can is through really honest and straightforward and business-like negotiations. And I would say that um, I think the ATU is stepping up to that um, in a very good way. Uh, and an example of that of late was our uh, revised hours of service policy that was negotiated with AT, and I give uh, Bruce Hansen, president of AT, very high marks for stepping up to a real problem and helping us solve it. Um, so my hope is that that's a um, an indicator of mm -hmm. the kind of um, work, hard work that we can do together. But it is very hard work, and it takes a long time. And remember, a union leader is just that; he's a leader of an organization. He has to bring and communicate with the membership. Uh, in order to bring them along. So we have to be respectful of that process as well. So let me play devil's advocate a little bit here. If we don't have binding arbitration as the methodology, then we have the potential for a transit strike. Yes, we right? do. Uh, which would obviously have a big impact on the community, particularly portions of the community that are transit dependent. Uh, how do we weigh that, that risk against the, the challenges we're having now in the current form of the process? Well, so that's this sort of flash forward where you, you, you're, you're weighing the chance, mm -hmm. the chance of a strike, which, you know, if you look historically around the country, very few, 
and pretty short when they occur. The only one that's happened in Oregon in modern times, if you will, was a week-long strike in Eugene, uh, and that's what led to that 2007 long line, versus the continued erosion of service with the benefit and um, wage program, primarily benef healthcare benefits that are not sustainable. And so you've got sort of this potential for the long-term erosion versus getting it fixed, even if it takes a little pain up front. Um, so those are the trade-offs, and yeah. it's an intelligent, I mean, our state legislature can help make those, is, has obviously made that trade-off, mm -hmm. um, and um, will play by the rules of the game, obviously, but, um, you know, I think there's really right. something to be thought about. And the bill this session that would have changed that is dead, is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding. Yeah.